Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by Mark Haupt, the CISO for Databank. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Databank is a managed services provider, and, and you're the CISO there. Can you Tell us a little bit about what that entails. How is that different from being a, a CISO for a, another type of organization? Yeah, sure. So Databank is a managed services and co-location center, uh, co- co-location data center provider. So in my experience of being a, both a chief technology officer and a chief information security officer in other organizations, the difference here is that we have such a broad range of of compliance items that we have to deal with in an enterprise type of environment or an environment where uh, a company is is singularly focused on a product or a series of products uh, y- you can really kind of focus your your compliance needs and your security needs onto those types of environments whereas in a managed services provider i'm dealing with the financial industry the healthcare industry the pci side of things uh, glba uh, sec types of things federal government related items and the list can go on uh, so it's it's it makes our security world if you will a very broad topic that we have to keep up on and that we have to understand and what does it mean to be a CISO for that type of organization what do you what are you spending your time doing or what are you responsible for so a lot of my time is spent with helping customers enter into uh, a managed services type of agreement and into the managed services uh, environment. A lot of our customers are coming from enterprise on on-site type of situations and they're not yet completely comfortable with the cloud. So to boil it down, I do a lot of sales work, but I don't look at it as sales. I look at it more as a consultative approach type of uh, type of work where I sit down with the customers. I understand their needs. I find out what they need from a compliance and security perspective, and I provide them with the matched uh, materials, the matched documents they need, the the um, the various products that they need from in order for them to be uh, secure. And what I've found a lot in this type of environment is the customers are coming to us not completely understanding uh, the security environment that they need to protect themselves. So we've had a lot of situations where customers are coming in, they're being told by their customers through RFPs or other types of uh, contractual obligations that they need to comply with a particular type of security uh, or compliance environment. Most typically, we found that with uh, FedRAMP or PCI, and the customers are coming to us, they're SMBs, or they're even sometimes uh, larger enterprises that have yet to have those kinds of things put on their plate by a contractual obligation, and they need to be walked through that process. Everything from understanding exactly what that compliance document the, the, or the compliance requirement is to how those tools and materials and documents that we produce for them, the audits and things like that, are put into place on their environment. That's interesting. I mean, I, I think we talk to um, you know a lot of customers at Tripwire, large enterprise organizations, where you know information security has has to deal with multiple compliance standards. Uh, obviously, with the threat environment as it changes, and and yes, they're focused on their business, but they still have a bit of that that multiplicity. It sounds like in your role, uh, you basically end up with the the aggregate of everything that that all of the customers might might have to deal with in terms of of security and compliance. Is is that is that right? That that is absolutely true. And even after the sale, uh, so to speak, we get a lot of customers coming back to us, and 
you know, when they have new contracts coming down the pipe and they start asking us, well, hey, I, I was just told I need to be ITAR compliant, or I was just told I need to be CMMC compliant, or NIST 800-171, or even ISO compliant, they come to us and they say, we don't know what those things are. Can you help us? How how can we be compliant in our current environment without having to uh, buy or stand up a whole new environment? So that that's absolutely true, what you're saying. So with such a broad range of, uh, you know, regulations and standards that you have to be familiar with, how, how do you keep up to date? I mean, it, that sounds like a, a serious challenge. Well, it is a very serious challenge. And the way that I keep up to date is, is a couple of things. I, I spend a lot of time in the evenings um, glancing over and, and reading uh, the various uh, news articles, if you will, that are out there so that I'm at least familiar with the, the various new terms that are coming out. And then as a customer approaches me, um, quite frankly, a lot of times I'll go do a little bit of, a little bit of research, uh, to either brush up on my existing knowledge or to make sure that the requirements haven't changed. Um, if I, if it's been something I haven't dealt with in quite a while. So it, it is a challenge. Um, sometimes it's, uh, kind of, I, I would somewhat call it playing like whack-a-mole where, where if something pops up, I need to go do some research on it. Uh, I gain a little bit of knowledge on it. And, and other times it's a, it's a standard approach of just constantly spending an hour or so or more a day reading what's out there, uh, what's available, and, and going and searching for it specifically. So, you know, top of my reading list the past couple of weeks, a couple of months actually, has been the new DO, Department of Defense, the DOD uh, maturity model, the CMMC. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of myths out there. Even the DOD just this past week had to come out with a statement um, about some of those myths and the fact that they have not certified anybody yet to actually certify a provider like us. So they don't have a third-party assessment organization yet that can um, assess an organization like Databank so we can move forward with CMMC certification. Uh, and the reason they had to come out with that is because there's been a lot of companies, a lot of assessment and audit companies that are out there claiming to be able to uh, certify a company against CMMC, and that's just not the truth. So one of the biggest challenges that I have is sifting through the truth versus, uh, you know, the fact versus the fiction type of thing. And one of the ways I do that is I always go back to the source. Uh, I have a, a, I have some experience, uh, if you will, doing intelligence analyst work, and we always graded our sources and so I always try and find my A1 sources uh, to, to make sure that those sources are are based in fact and they are coming from uh, the the people that are responsible for it. So that's this week with the CMMC situation. I went back to the DoD head of that uh, or that portion of the organization, and I looked at that person's tweets and other social media posts, and I found exactly what I was looking for uh, in that article. That's really interesting. I, the idea of you know in this this world of um, you know questionable information, sometimes disinformation, that idea of grading sources and having a mental model for uh, quickly assessing how close to the original source your information is. And the skills to go find the original source, if you can, I think that's valuable inside of information security, outside of information security. Uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's something I haven't really thought of before. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just give a lot of people, you know, on this podcast, a, you know, a, a, a definitely go and do that. Figure it out. Go on Wikipedia and understand how to grade sources, because one of the biggest problems we're dealing with right now, a lot of people don't realize how much. Uh, this uh, this coronavirus COVID nineteen situation is a an information security problem because we're a lot of us are responsible for our, our uh, business continuity plans and and uh, co continuity of operation plans and one of the things I do for my team on a daily basis uh, my management team is I send out a daily brief and I grade the intel sources on that so they know 
how they should view the article that I placed on there, whether it's considered, you know, hard gospel as, you know, it's a, it's a law or, or a, a directive by a governor, or if it's just a summary uh, that's been put together by a media source. The grading on that intel is absolutely important for my management to be able to make the right decisions. And, and it, that's true, not just with, the coronavirus COVID-19 situation, but it's true with all the data that we put together. You know, going back to the CMC, CMMC situation, if I came out and I said, well, I saw that uh, this particular uh, third-party assessor claims to be able to do this, and I ran with that without validating the information, I could be giving my customers bad information. I could be spreading f- uh, fiction and um, and directing people in, in the wrong direction, and, and I'll have to eat my words later if uh, if if I'm not getting the information from a, an A1 graded source. Yeah, the idea of of having a, as a CISO providing your your stakeholders, uh, your executives with that kind of a daily briefing with graded sources is something um I, that, that's something pretty actionable that people could actually actually just go do uh and it would um you know improve uh the internal perception of their role and and you know how they their level of um you know uh, how informed they are about information security and changes that go on. So I, I like that. Right. I've hmm. found it, it increases my uh, credibility with my leadership. If they know the, the grading of the source and, and know, you know, how I view it uh, in, in that, in that grading process. Yeah. So um, you mentioned a couple of different compliance standards uh, before, and given that you're in a shared tenant environment, and uh, you know I have this this statement that there's no such thing as compliance without audit. I have to assume that you end up dealing with uh, auditors and auditing, you know, across the board um, in your in your role. Is that right? Absolutely. Well, I deal with five different audits a year. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Now, back to your host, Tim Erlen. What are your what's your best advice for operating effectively in an environment with multiple audits like that? Um, because I, I know a lot of organizations have multiple compliance needs and they may have internal and external audit. And they'd be in a similar situation, although not across multiple tenants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a couple of strategies that I take. Um, number one, so I've, I've already mentioned I have five audits a year. Um, so I've looked at my audits and tried to group them together so we could do some of them simultaneously. So I cannot do my FedRAMP audit um, at the same time as the others. The the ability to do that from a, a a workload perspective is not there. Uh, typically, the three PAOs that do the FedRAMP audits are, um, they may be able to do a SAS, or, I'm sorry, an SSA 18 audit or, or another type of audit, but they typically will not do those simultaneously with the sev- same evidence. There's different evidence pieces, artifacts that are collected. So I break them out um, and I do the FedRAMP audits in the spring and I do my uh, PCI my HIPAA and my uh, SSA 18 audits uh, in in the fall uh, because the uh, HIPAA, PCI, and SSA 18, we can reuse artifacts. So if I submit one one piece of evidence, uh, it could be used for all, f- all four of those uh, I- environments, so those, all four of those audits, uh, and it's it can be done by the same auditor. So that's one strategy that I've applied uh, to the situation. Second strategy I've applied to the situation is use a common baseline uh, for security controls. So we're a NIST 800-53 revision 4 uh, security control shop. And so everything that I do is geared towards complying with NIST because that's our, our highest standard. And if there is a 
particular control in another standard that causes me to raise that um, that I will for that one control. So an example is that the NIST standard uh, asks you to do a penetration test on an annual basis where PCI asks it to be done twice a year. So we raise it to that twice a year level. So um, break up your audits uh, and, and gr- well, group them, but break them up if you can uh, in, in the types you're doing. Uh, do it based upon one standard and then, you know, finally, um, you know, be able to have a message that goes out to your team uh, that they understand the importance of these audits and and have a continuous monitoring process in place that allows you to collect as many artifacts as you can without bothering uh, other people throughout the organization. So do automation, do standardized reporting on a monthly basis for uh, for various pieces of your environment uh, so that you could just go into a ticketing system or go to a, a repository as an audit artifact collector and grab the information that's out there without bothering people, you know, multiple times a year. The data should already be out there. So do you do you aim to be essentially continuously audit ready in that sense? Yes. So, you know, yeah. the heart of the okay. heart of continuous monitoring uh, is that you're essentially audit ready uh, for for most of your organization? So we do uh, daily, weekly, monthly, and uh, quarterly continuous monitoring, and so we should be able to take those reports that we develop for those you know timed events and turn them over to our auditors uh, and. and you know, we, we kind of gear the controls uh, within we have for our auditors towards those reports and vice versa. Yeah. And then uh, the other challenge that, that might be interesting to talk about a bit there is that, that you've got, uh, you know, shared infrastructure, you've got tenant specific infrastructure, and then, of course, the, the customers have their own infrastructure. So there are some interesting boundaries there to deal with in terms of audit and compliance, I imagine. Right, right. absolutely. And so, you know, one of the one of the best things that's come out of PCI is the requirement to have a, um, a, a boundary uh, diagram uh, as part of it, as well as a, hmm. a, a, a document, in our case, a spreadsheet that identifies the boundaries that are responsible by or for you know, data banks responsible for and what the customer is responsible for. So that responsibility matrix in, in my type of environment is, is paramount to success um, because it, it limits what my auditors audit um, and it clearly documents and defines for my customers what they're, what they need to go and do and they need, their auditors need to do. You could even transfer that easily over into a, um, into an enterprise environment where you define through that uh, that uh, responsibilities matrix uh, which departments within your organization are responsible for which layers of the environment. Yeah, we've seen, I mean, with PCI at least, we've seen a, a significant push to, you know, reduce the, the size of the cardholder data environment specifically to avoid the, you know, the, the burden of audit. But there's no reason that that type of, of uh, approach or method couldn't apply to other uh, you know, standards. I mean, you've got a, a, you know, some kind of scope for that audit and the more you can reduce it or at least articulate it clearly, the, the more you can be sort of continuously prepared. What about the difference between, uh, you know, different size of customers, you know, small customers versus, you know, large enterprises. Um, I think you end up dealing with, with all of them across the board or are there specific verticals that are particularly interesting or challenging, um, from a, a, you know, um, security standpoint? Yeah, it's not the verticals that are challenging. It's the size of the corporation. Um, you would think that the larger the corporation, the more people they have watching you, the bigger the problem that they will be. And that's absolutely not true. Actually, the bigger they are, the more cooperation we get because they understand where the boundaries are and they understand their responsibilities better. Where I've found the biggest challenge is the smaller the company um, and the less less technical the company is, the more that they are or the less that they're informed on what they should be doing. I've had a number of situations where SMBs who are very good at what they do in their vertical, let's just say as an example, a healthcare type of vertical, um, where HIPAA, HIPAA applies and possibly PCI as well. I've had a number of SMB type of customers come to us and believe that if they put all of the HIPAA related data and all of the 
uh, PCI cardholder data into our environment, that that absolves them whatsoever of, of being responsible for HIPAA. And we've had a couple situations where I literally have been on the phone with the CEO of that company and their lawyer, and their lawyer has gone to the CEO and said, you know what, their, their, their chief information security officer is correct. We still have to comply with HIPAA. Um, that, you know, that company, our customer, is still considered the covered entity because they're responsible for the data. Mm-hmm. A lot of people mm-hmm. do not understand that the managed service provider never assumes or takes responsibility for the data. It's still the customer's responsibility. Yeah, I mean, that's a challenge we've seen with, um, you know, movement to the cloud as well as, uh, you know, managed service providers. This idea that somehow Amazon or uh, Microsoft is suddenly responsible for securing your data. Uh, when in fact they are very clear about what they're responsible for and and what they're not. It's just a matter of you, you know, maybe not having read it as a that's, as a customer. That's correct. The MSAs are very important, mm-hmm. and understanding them is is very important to running an SMB type of situation. Yeah. So, from your perspective, you know, as a as a CISO for a you know a shared tenant kind of environment, a managed service provider. What do you see as the the biggest changes that are coming in terms of the the attack surface? What are we what should we be looking forward to with uh, you know if not with worry but you know with um, foresight and planning that that we should be prepared for? Well, I, I think the biggest change that's coming is not necessarily an attack surface, but is uh, is in privacy. Uh, there is a bill that's been placed before the Senate uh, by Senator Moran out of uh, Kansas that is somewhat um, countering some of the state laws that are out there that have been developed, uh, the CCPA, for example, and to bring a little bit more of um, uh, maturity, uh, if you will, from the federal that's side the, of things. the California Consumer Privacy Act, right? Right, right. The, yes, the California Consumer Privacy yeah. Act. Um so there, there's a federal bill that's on the table right now that was introduced in the past week to uh, to to deal with that, if you will, or to to address that. Now, as far as actual attack services, um, ransomware is huge. Uh, DDoS protection or D- DDoSes actually are are on the rise, and a lot of people don't realize that because there's such an an old attack method. Um, so those two items, I think, are going to be the biggest things that we have to deal with in the next six months to a year. And then there's always the advanced persistent threat or the nation state attackers that are out there. And those situations change from day to day, month to month. Um, you know, you, you know, right now with this COVID situation, we have a little bit of a, uh, a some rhetoric, if you will, uh, going on between uh, China and uh, the United States uh, and their leaders um, about the source of this virus. Well, the, the the words that have been used on both sides are words that can result in cyber attacks in response. Um, we've seen those kinds of things before. So those are the biggest things that I'm looking for, um, you know, right now. Uh, you know, that can change in a matter of days or even months. But right now it's ransomware, it's DDoS attacks, and it's um, anything that a nation state wants to throw in, as a result of situations. And, you know, frankly, we've had two of those already in 2020. We've had the situation with Iran at the beginning of the year where there was a major cyber threat um, that, that existed mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and or could have existed. And, and now with the, the rhetoric between Washington and and Beijing, there's a rea- reality that there's a cyber threat that exists there. Yeah, I think the um, you know, the changes in attack techniques or attack types is something that that sort of goes on constantly. Your point about legislative changes around privacy, uh, that's something that that I don't I don't think is always on our radar, but has material impact on the business. I mean, that's that's where compliance and auditing you know become a, a significant burden for for organizations. So that that's well worth worth paying attention to as well. Absolutely, especially this law not only addresses privacy, but it, it puts a burden upon all companies of all sizes to have and I quote robust security controls in place. Um and those robust security controls are open for definition of what that means. You know, I, mm-hmm. I've I've actually had contact with Senator Moran's office and have suggested that they be a little more clear on what robust security controls mean. Does that mean NIST 853? Does that mean ISO? Does that mean you know NIST 800-171 for for that matter? Uh, it, it would be very helpful if we 
had a better idea of what quote unquote robust security controls means. All right. Well, uh, Mark, it looks like we're at the end of our time. I, I certainly appreciate you spending the time with us. It was a very interesting conversation. Uh, lots to pick apart in there. I think we could actually keep talking for quite a long time. Yes, we probably but, uh, could. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I hope it was uh, helpful and enjoyable and interesting for everyone. And please join us again on the next Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thank you. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.